is a decisive weapon. In the 15th, the cannon smashes ancient walls, then takes to the open field. The handgun revolutionizes warfare, but the sword is symbol of a warrior tradition that won't die. Everywhere, European gunpowder armies triumph. August 26, 1346. After months of fighting to gain the French crown, the English king, Edward III, draws up his weary army near the village of Crecy in northern France. For a thousand years, the horseman has dominated the battlefield. The English are outnumbered but they have faith, faith in their firepower, faith in the long bow. Years of fighting the Scots and Welsh have taught Edward new tactics to exploit the long bow's potential. As day breaks at Cressy, Edward set his defenses. He dug holes to trap the French cavalry. He studded his front line with stakes to impale enemy horses. But at the core of the English battle plan was one decisive weapon, the long bow. It was tall as a man and made from the wood of the yew tree. It took a hundred pounds of force to draw and was deadly at 200 yards. It took more strength to draw than the crossbow, but it could be fired faster and farther. As the English archers prepared for battle, Edward arrived with his knights. But today at Crecy, the English cavalry would not fight on horseback. Edward dismounted his knights and stood them among his archers in a V-shaped formation known as the Harrow. The French were confident of victory. They outnumbered the English three to one. Against the English longbow, the French now deployed the crossbow. The French King Philip had hired 6,000 mercenaries from Genoa. These soldiers, expert crossbowmen, marched down the hill toward the English defenses. A chronicler of the time, Geoffrey Le Baker, described the scene. The first charge was made by the French against the English with resounding trumpets, drums and kettle drums with strident clarions. And with shouting almost like thunder, the crossbowmen of the French advanced. their 
quarrels reached the English. The English were out of range of the Genoese crossbows. But the Genoese were well within reach of the English longbow. The English archers then advanced one step forward and shot their arrows with such force and quickness that it seemed as if it snowed. The Genoese threw down their weapons and fled. This so disgusted the French king, he ordered his mounted knights to attack. The French knights charged through the confused lines of retreating crossbowmen. The ground was soft after rain. Within seconds, the French attack became a churning, muddy mass of chain mail, horses and men, all writhing under the hail of English arrows. The French were in disarray. A few of their knights were driven into the English lines by the sheer impetus of their charge. They were beaten down with axes, lances and swords. And in the middle of the host, many Frenchmen were crushed to death without any wound, simply by the weight of numbers. After 16 fruitless charges, the French withdrew, utterly defeated. The English remained in battle formation throughout the night. At sunrise, Edward's messengers found 1,542 French lords and knights dead beside 20,000 men and horses. The English lost two knights and 80 men. The English victory at Crecy stunned Europe. To the Europeans, English tactics based on the firepower of the longbow came as a complete surprise. A new day was dawning for the infantrymen. The horsemen would have a place on the battlefield for centuries to come but he would no longer dominate as he had for the last thousand years. The days of the mounted knight were over. But the whiz of English arrows was not the only sound of firepower at Crecy. Edward had brought to the battle a handful of bombards, early cannon that hurled stone balls. The bombard was loud, inaccurate, and did little more than frighten the French horses. Yet, it delivered the opening shot in a revolution that would transform war and civilization forever. Gunpowder. Fourteen fifty three, where Europe meets Asia. Constantinople. For a thousand years, this great city has protected Christianity in the East. Now it is the last bastion of Constantine, eighty eighth Emperor of Byzantium. His empire is a Christian island lapped by the rising tide of Islam. As Islamic soldiers approach, farmers and peasants seek shelter. The 
once great empire has shrunk to the city of Constantinople and the farmland around it. North, south, east, and west, all has fallen to Islam. Constantine must rally his people. Only the walls of Constantinople stand between the Christian Empire and the triumph of Islam. A hundred and thirty miles to the northwest, in Adrianople, a young Turkey Sultan, Mehmet II, had just become ruler of the Ottomans. He cast his eyes on the greatest prize of all, Constantinople, a prize those before him failed to take. Mehmet was ambitious. He also was interested in new technology. A Hungarian engineer, Urban, brought him plans for a super gun. Mehmet was fascinated. Constantine already had refused Urban's new gun. It was too expensive. Urban built and tested his super gun. It fired an 18-inch diameter granite ball up to a mile, burying itself six feet deep in the earth. Mehmet made plans to lay siege to Constantinople. He positioned the super gun outside the main gate. On April 12th, 1453, his cannon roared. The thick city walls that for centuries had protected the Christian capital in the east crumbled in weeks. Mehmet's troops poured into the city. For days, they looted and murdered. Eventually, a severed head was delivered to Mehmet. They said it was Constantine's. Later, a headless body was discovered in Constantine's armor. Gunpowder had won Islam a toehold in the West. Mehmet's supergun altered the course of history. But it wasn't a weapon to be dragged from siege to siege. It needed 60 oxen and 200 men to haul it into place. Once positioned, it took over an hour to load. Its recoil was so great, it took three hours to realign so it could be fired again. For lengthy campaigns, lighter, more mobile weapons would be needed. Forty years later, the French King Charles VIII discovered how to make them. The new guns were light, metal weapons, founded in bronze by the same technique used for making church bells. He called these light metal tubes cannon, from the Latin word canna meaning tube. Because they were light, the cannon were mobile. And because they fired iron balls, they were more effective against city walls. This was the birth of mobile gunpowder artillery. In 1494, Charles VIII invaded Italy, armed with 40 of the new light cannon.
The Florentine diplomat and historian, Francesco Guicciardini, watched his progress. They moved the cannon on carts, which were drawn not by oxen, as was the custom in Italy, but by horses. The men and equipment assigned to this work were so skillful that they could almost always keep up with the rest of the army. The cannon were planted against the walls with such speed, the space between the shots was so brief, and the balls flew so speedily and were driven with such force that as much execution was inflicted in a few hours as used to be done in Italy over the same number of days. In a few short weeks, Charles Cannon blasted away the security of centuries. After food, water, and shelter, people always have needed security from attack. From the earliest times, nature provided man with refuge. There were mountains to retreat to, caves to hide in. Men not only exploited nature's fortresses, they improved on them. High in the mountains, it was easy to hack out a home from a hole in the rock. But the rocky slopes of a mountain are poor land for farming. The valleys and lowlands where farmers lived were harder to defend. As farmers worked their land, they produced a surplus of food and livestock. They were at risk from raiders in constant search of food and supplies. To protect their crops and animals, the earliest farmers fortified their dwellings. As the enemy grew more determined, the farmers built high defensive walls. Over the centuries, these walls evolved from a simple place of refuge to the purpose-built stronghold. Built on a natural strong point, a hill, island, or peninsula, the simple wall and tower design lasted for centuries. The ideal stronghold could be used for attack as well as defense. From it, the garrison could launch a counterattack. The stronghold's walls were not only difficult to attack, they also were dangerous to approach. High vantage points created deep killing grounds. High curtain walls made attackers vulnerable. Putting up ladders or siege towers was dangerous. The height of walls was more important than the thickness, as direct attack could often be repulsed given a strong vantage point. For centuries, man used his ingenuity to find new ways to break through castle walls. A bizarre array of siege engines was designed and built. the attacker's ingenuity. Those inside the castle usually have the advantage. From the building of the ancient walls of Jericho 
to the end of the Middle Ages, fortification engineers added little to the three basic defenses, wall, moat, tower. Overnight, the arrival of the cannon made them obsolete. The gun was a revolutionary weapon. It also very quickly revolutionized defenses. You had to have a new kind of fortification, which uh, instead of being tall, was as low as possible and as thick as possible, so that, so that it would nullify the effects of the smashing impact of the gun's shot. It was also seen very quickly to present many deflecting surfaces. So you get this very distinctive shape. The new defenses are technically called artillery forts, but they're often thought of as star forts because in plan they did often resemble stars. And the idea was that the incoming ball would glance off the uh, angles of the star. Instead of being able to hit the face of the wall directly and do it damage in that way, they would uh, bounce sideways and the energy of the impact would be absorbed by the thick earth bank behind the masonry face. This is Berwick upon Tweed. Throughout centuries of war between England and Scotland, this city changed hands in one bloody siege after another. Here at Berwick, the impact of cannon on fort design is clear. These walls show to perfection the military architect's answer to the cannon, the angled bastion system. The importance of the bastion was twofold. First of all, it protected the face of the fortress from direct artillery fire. They were also fire bases themselves from which artillery could return fire against the enemy's besieging artillery, but also defending infantry could bring the attacking infantry under fire from flank and rear and various other angles. The outworks of a fortress composed uh, an extremely dangerous killing zone, a set of killing zones, which were a horrifying area for infantry to find themselves in. You were entering a sort of masonry maze full of what to the attacker's view were dead ends and blind alleys and overhangs. Precipices, really, of lethal masonry or brickwork. But these were expensive defenses. City after city bankrupted itself in the arms race started by the cannon. Fortification was by far the greatest object of state expenditure in the 16th and 17th and even in the 18th century. In 1677, over 200 years after Mehmet's gun blew down the walls of Constantinople, Marshal Vauban became the French Commissary General of Fortifications. Vauban built over a hundred fortresses and conducted some 40 sieges, many of them against forts he himself designed. Vauban's systems of attack and defense were precise. If he knew the number and type of attacking guns and the design of the fort, Vauban could predict exactly how long a siege would last. The cannon transformed siege warfare. The handgun would revolutionize war on the field of battle. The impact of the cannon on fortification was revolutionary. But on the field of battle, Heavy artillery could only be used on wheeled carriages. Big guns were too slow to keep pace with the tempo of battle.
As cavalry and foot soldiers advanced or retreated, cannon got stuck in the mud. As late as the 16th and 17th century, men still fought like the ancient Greeks. Once inside a phalanx, or pike square, attackers could choose from a grisly range of hardware to butcher their opponents. But first, they had to get past the pikes, face to face, steel to steel. They still didn't have a way of blasting in from a safe distance. One answer to this problem was an unwieldy, handheld gun, the arquebus. Foot soldiers turned to the gun as their weapon of choice. Its transformation from ugly launching tube to finely crafted weapon speaks of the pride with which infantry and cavalry regarded their new weapons. All that was needed was a quick and safe way to fire it. Two rival mechanisms offered a solution, the match lock and the wheel lock. The matchlock used a fuse to ignite gunpowder in the flash pan. In dry conditions, it worked. Simpler but more expensive was the wheel lock. It used new clockwork technology to strike a spark from a small piece of iron pyrite. More dependable than the matchlock, here was a gun that could be used by cavalry, the first carbine. Simpler still was the flintlock, which struck the vital spark from flint and steel. Simplicity won, and for the next 200 years, pistols and rifles would be fired this way. The gun was coming of age. The gun, like the longbow, could pierce armor, but for accuracy, range, and rate of fire, it was still inferior. The gun had one big advantage over the longbow. The skill and sheer strength needed to draw a bow demanded years of daily practice. A gunner could be trained in weeks. In the early 17th century, a Dutch nobleman, William of Nassau, studied the Roman tacticians. He read how Roman legions kept up a steady rain of javelins on the enemy. Nassau realized that modern soldiers armed with muskets could do the same. All they had to do was rotate their ranks. The principle was simple. Don't aim, just send in a wall of lead. The air was so darkened by the smoke of the powder that for a quarter of an hour together, I dare say, there was no light seen but what the fire of the volleys of shot gave. 
Rapid volley required tight coordination in the heat of battle if muskets were to fire at the same time. Musketeers drilled hard. The faster they could fire, reload, and fire again, the more deadly they were. In 1631, at the Battle of Breitenfeldt, the Swedish king, Gustavus Adolphus, showed the full potential of volley fire. He had drilled his men until they had the fastest reload times ever. In this battle against an army of the Holy Roman Empire, 7,000 lay dead, felled by rapid volley fire, most killed in the first two hours. Toward the end of the 17th century, rulers began to pay more attention to army medical care. Military hospitals were set up to cope with the increased killing power of the new weapons. This is the Josephinum, a surgical research hospital founded by Joseph II of Austria. Joseph was the first ruler to recognize the skill needed to heal gunshot wounds and return soldiers to the battlefield. His academy, the Josephinum, established the status of military surgeons. Previously, butchers and barbers had treated battlefield casualties. The Josephinum developed standardized instruments and manuals that became the model for field surgery worldwide. Anatomical research was carried out on detailed wax effigies. They were modeled in Florence on the bodies of executed criminals. Swords, pikes, and lances inflicted flesh wounds which could be understood at a glance by the surgeon. A gunshot wound demanded that the hidden path of a bullet be traced inside the cavities of the human body before it could be extracted. This was leading scientific research of the time, before the Josephinum's investigation of gunshot wounds, military surgeons knew next to nothing of human anatomy. Relentlessly, the gun was driving man's advances in surgery, in engineering, and in efficient killing. Man's capacity to inflict death had increased beyond imagining. Fifteen seventy five, Japan is a lawless country. That year, a battle between two warlords made history. Takeda Katsuyori led Japan's finest army, famous for its ferocious cavalry and disciplined foot soldiers. Facing him was rival warlord Oda Nabunaga. Katsuyori's men were armed with swords. Nabunaga's with guns. 
With his three rows of arquebusiers, Nobunaga simply blew Katsuyori's cavalry apart. Japan saw the power of the gun. It played a major role in the wars to unify the country. Then something extraordinary happened. 100 years later, the gun had vanished in Japan. The reasons are found in Japanese warrior culture. While the sword always had been important to the Western warrior, in Japan it was cult. The sword was sacred, part of Zen Buddhism and the pursuit of two warrior ideals, fidelity and indifference to physical hardship. The best samurai swords often had four million layers of forged steel. They are the finest edged weapons ever made. No people in history revered the sword as highly as the samurai of Japan. In Japan, for a time, it would displace the gun. Forging the samurai sword demands more than just superb craftsmanship. The swordsmith carefully chooses the steel, one piece at a time. He hammers until it can be folded around another layer, making a laminate. But for a proper Japanese sword, you have to work the raw material yourself. You have to make your own raw material. You see, a good sword must be made with good ingredients. It is the most basic part of the process and takes a lot of time and concentration. It is the most fundamental part, so if you get this wrong, you lose everything. To this day, the martial skills of the samurai are passed from generation to generation. In the 19th century, Japan would turn again to the gun. But even today, firearms play no part in the traditional learning of Bushido, the way of the warrior. The thin piece of hagane that goes inside is low in carbon content and malleable. The U-shaped piece that goes on the outside is harder, containing more carbon. The harder the metal, the better it will cut. But that means it will also be brittle. That's why you need the more malleable metal inside. This is the traditional recipe for a sword which both cuts well and does not break. The folding process is vital to the ultimate sharpness and flexibility of each sword. The swordsmith is more than a craftsman, more even than an artist. He has a spiritual role that requires constant prayer, each prayer being folded into the steel. To produce a true and reliable blade, the swordsmith must be pure in mind and body. These elaborate preparations clearly demonstrate the spiritual significance of the samurai sword. Eight, 
This school, Maniwa Nenyu, has continued unbroken for 21 generations in the Higuchi family. Here, martial arts are taught as an extension of religion and a veneration for the past. Close to the school is the shrine, the cemetery of ancestors and the family museum. In Japan, there is no other way to learn the way of the warrior. The Japanese outlawed the gun because it threatened the status of the warrior swordsman. But as an island nation, the Japanese could easily enforce a ban on firearms. With laws to protect it, the cult of the sword continued, unchallenged, for another 250 years. The swordsmith's art tells us more about why Japan gave up the gun. All the ingredients used to make the blade are elemental. Straw to prevent the metal from overheating, carbon, fire, water, to conform with the Japanese belief in the importance of unity with nature and natural forces. Even the muscular effort of the smith is natural. The chemical energy of gunpowder is not. Gunpowder reached Japan when tradition and religion enjoyed great respect. Sword play was traditional. The best swords were often ancient heirlooms with their own personal names, handed on from father to son. It was customary to test the quality of new blades on the corpses of executed criminals. This was known as Tameshi Giri, the corpse being called a Tameshi Mono or chopping block. Swordsmiths used to go to the execution ground, bringing with them blades they wanted to try out, and the servants in charge of the place would pile corpses on one another. A blade of exceptional quality could cut through the corpses of three men with one blow, according to the records, and it was certainly possible with a good blade to cut the body of a man in half. A sword which could not cut off a man's head with one stroke was considered useless and discarded. In 1854, almost 300 years after the Battle of Nagashino, the ships of U.S. Commodore Perry arrived in Tokyo Bay bearing guns. America was only seven years away from its bitter and all-consuming civil war. With Western technology poised to take over the world, Japan prepared to end a quarter of a millennium without gunpowder. Five hundred years ago, the greatest empire in the Americas thrived here. It became great, not because of its land or its wealth or its armies, but because of something no one could see, fear. Some empires thrive because they strike terror in their enemies. This empire thrived 
because the rulers themselves were governed by fear. These people are descendants of the Aztecs, whose empire dominated Central America in the 15th century. The Aztecs worshiped the sun. At the heart of their religion was the fear that one day the sun might not rise, killing their crops, plunging them into fatal darkness. To ensure the daily reappearance of their life force, the Aztecs sacrificed to the sun god on a grand scale. To slake the sun god's never-ending thirst, the Aztecs trained not to kill their foes, but to bring them back alive. Aztec warfare required extraordinary courage. It is more difficult and dangerous to capture an enemy than to kill him. The Aztecs' weapons were designed to wound, not to kill. Wooden swords and clubs edged with stone. Every opponent of the Aztecs knew his fate if captured. The Aztecs would single out their victim on the battlefield. He would be chosen for his physical fitness. He would then be lamed, grabbed by the hair, and disarmed. Bound hand and foot, he was carried back to the Aztec capital, Tenochtitlan. Here the prisoner was treated like a king, served the finest food, given drink, women, everything for his comfort. But all the while, the Aztecs gently teased him about his fate. On the appointed morning, the prisoner was led up the steep steps to the Aztec temple. Taken to the altar and bent backwards over the altar stone. There, his chest was slit open by the priests, his living heart torn from his body and hurled into a burning crucible. Aztec homage to the sun. On permanent display near the Aztec warrior school were the skulls of all who died in sacrifice. When the Aztec empire was at its height, a strange breed of warrior arrived from another world. Europe, the old world. Their leader was Hernando Cortez. Cortez was looking for gold. He also was looking for glory. Armed with gunpowder, Cortez fought a vicious, bloody war against men armed with primitive weapons who had never seen horses or guns. The Aztec king described meeting Cortez's army. He began to be afraid. He marveled at hearing the business of the artillery, especially the thunderous sounds that burst the eardrums and the stench of the powder. There was bitter fighting in the complex canal system around what is now Mexico City. The Aztecs moved quickly from place to place in small carved wooden boats throwing up temporary bridges, then retracting them to confound the Spanish. The 
Aztec soldiers took many Spanish prisoners and many Spanish heads. They even took the heads of the Spanish horses. But in the end, the power of the gun, the horse and armor, all turned the tide in the Spaniards' favor. By 1521, the Aztec capital lay in ruins, destroyed by Cortez's guns. The Spaniards brought more than European firepower to Mexico. From the old world, they brought something no one could see, disease, lethal to native peoples of the new world. What happened to the Aztecs foretold the future of native peoples in America, Africa, and Asia. The gun would soon make Europe master of the world. <laughs> 